1995 American horror film Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions, starring Scott Bakula, Kevin J. O'Connor, Famke Jansen, Daniel Von Bargen, and many more. Let's take a quick look. Something is watching. Something is listening. Something is coming. How would you like to see the world the way it really is? What's going on here? Detective Harry Damour is walking a path. I want you to help me. Will you take the job, Mr. Damour? Where do I sign up? Between what can be seen, people are dying here. I want to know why I've heard a name. Somebody they talk about in whispers. Who? Nix. And what must be feared? Nix is dead and buried. What the hell is wrong with you people? Haven't you seen enough to know that doesn't matter? No. I don't want him getting in the way. We've all of us waited too long to have the homecoming spoiled. Every step he takes. The drone. The dark side. You don't like that. Not much. It's your destiny. Accept it. Brings him closer to the truth. You could get into people's heads, make them see things, terrible things. See, that's his best trick. No illusions, just the truth. If Nix is back from the dead, then he is some kind of a god. In a world where magic is real, death is the ultimate illusion. I was born to murder the world. For my wisdom. It's not real. Stop looking at me! You want to come with me, Damor? I've got so much power to give you. All you have to do is beg. Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions. Chris! Oh, hey there, John. How's it going? Hey, welcome to the Cult of Film, sir. It's a very nice place you got here, John. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> have been on before, uh, sometimes with Ian. I th maybe this is the first time by yourself, but yeah, well, you've been on the channel, that is. Welcome to the Cult of Films, and we're doing this a little bit differently. Uh, I've never seen the film that we're going to talk about tonight, and that is 1989's Grandmother's House. So what is Grandmother's House about, Chris? <laughs> oh, man, that movie was so good, and I'm so sad we lost it. <laughs> I mean, I okay, I exaggerate. It's not so good, but it was something. I, I think you were really the only one that liked it, to be honest, Chris. I like my grannies. I like my grannies, John. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you either, man. Uh, no, but we, we actually are uh, talking about 1995's Lord of Illusions, uh, directed by Clive Barker. Clive Barker's last film that he directed. This was one that, you know, I asked you what, what film that you would like to talk about, and you picked this one. I have never seen it. What made you kind of love Lord of Illusions? Uh, I'm pr I'm like a really big Clive Barker movie fan, so I've read like a few of his books. Uh, he's a good writer for certain, but Lord of Illusions, much like Hellraiser for me, is just Clive Barker makes this really good tone in his movies, and the writing is generally really pretty good. So he like paints these images in my mind, kind of like H.P. Lovecraft type style of like really really like interesting things kind of like staring into the abyss kind of stuff um now some of his movies like this one and now you can even say hellraiser they're both fun in their effects but like sometimes i think like his writing outshines the quality of the effects and stuff like that so it kind of makes it cheesier um but i think this movie has a lot going for it and i don't know if it's a cult movie cult classic but I, i've always really enjoyed it well, it had a budget of $11 million. It had a box office of $13 million. This was before the time where now, you know, studios are just cranking out, like Blumhouse and stuff, they're cranking out these little small horror films, and some yeah. of them are blowing up and making tons of money. And you can, you can make horror movies for, you know, shoestring budget now and have them churn out these massive returns, where this one, 
it was very, you know, even though it was an $11 budget, we're talking about 1995, and it was very ambitious. Uh, sure. Perhaps maybe too ambitious because it was right on the cutting edge of integrating CGI into... Seamless. Seamless. <laughs> the origami man. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely the worst aspect, the CGI. Oh. So, so it, it And that's what I'm talking about with, like, the cheesiness comes into play because yeah. if you didn't have that stuff there's a lot of like disturbing things people say that like paint really interesting imagery in my mind that like elevates it above a lot of other horror um but yeah that that kind of stuff yeah, yeah it's like S scott abula is what <laughs> i'm gonna refer to him as in this movie running around without a shirt on for 30 minutes fighting cgi monsters yeah it's a little much. It's, i mean scott bacula talk about the ultimate dad protagonist like he looks like ben stiller and tom cruise had a kid and you know that's not the the best image or you know not what you really want to go for when you're when you're going but i mean he was great i'm not saying he's a he's a bad guy kind of a, a henry winkler esque the yeah. thing the thing that i loved about this film um is that Clive Barker not only try to push the envelope with with the effects and the story, but also the way that horror movies kind of function, where horror movies are all about the the villain. The villain drives the narrative. It's all about you know a, a group of people or of throwaways mostly. You know, like ninety percent of your characters in a horror mm -hmm. film usually are throwaway characters because they're all just there to be red shirted. But this, he he tried to do something differently, and he put a a protagonist in there that you fall around, and you care about, and that way he could get really fucked up. And you know, all these things are kind of happening to this one person. I, I quite like that. I think that's a very underrated and underused utilized uh thing to do putting a, a protagonist like this in your horror film yeah well uh harry demore i know is a character from a bunch of his books he's also in the scarlet gospels which is the sequel to hellraiser which i read like half of it and gets pretty bad but what i like is that you as a viewer kind of like take on harry demore's like He's your he's your entrance into this world. So he's just as lost as you are kind of like learning about magic and stuff like that. That's the cool thing about this movie is every time I think of magic, it's always like a sword and sword is three fantasy kind of thing. Right. But this is like layered on like in a real dark way where it's like this blood magic and it's you know, it's it's definitely more horrifying than it is fantastical. You know what I mean? Yeah, and these are adaptations from his short stories, the Book of Blood series, right? Mm -hmm. That's where this came from. Yeah, I think this is like the allu the last illusion or something like that. You're right. And, and Clive Barker's a, a tough one for me, man. I, I can never tell if he's like super interesting or just kind of like a complete douche. Like a, a quote from him is like, "Nothing gets in the way of my art except sex." You know, it's just like <laughs> he's just one of those like. I don't know. He, he's like super one-liner man, but then the stuff that he well, produces, I it's mean, hard to argue with his his results. In his defense, he does do a lot of art. Yeah, N not a lot of sex. No, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no, I know he had uh, he had like some sort of medical issue like the last ten years, something with the dentist or something. He almost died, so uh, he hasn't been nearly as active as he was, in, you know, Hellraiser days. But it is a shame that he stopped in '95. I, I, you can argue the merits of this movie, but I don't think in any way that it's bad. Right. Um, I think it has a lot going for it. So I, I just wish he would have continued because he had Hellraiser, Nightbreed, and this. And this is more similar to Hellraiser than it is to Nightbreed. But those are all like super interesting movies that are, to me, are very memorable. Yeah, and, and talking about all those films, I, I think for sure my favorite Clive Barker films are the Hellraiser films. Um, sure. Night, Nightbreed's great too. This, you know, uh, I guess spoiler alert for what I think of this film, but I, I think it's my least favorite Barker film, but I still really enjoyed it. Like, and I enjoyed it. Like I got done watching it and I was just like, that was, that was okay. You know, that was fine. But then I kept thinking about it and then I kept wanting to think about it. And I just, I really appreciate like he went for it with the special effects. Like he always does. Everything looked gooey and gross and, and very Clive Barker ish. Um, and and the imagery is really good, and it had some so good. some really memorable scenes that we'll we'll kind of get into. But oh, yeah. you know, I asked you on the cult of films. You picked an occult of films. Uh, what is <laughs> Lord of Illusions about, Chris? Lord of Illusions opens with this kind of like Manson esque cult in the desert, um, and we're already like brought into this action, which is another reason why I really like this movie. And you have this maniacal guy named Nix, who apparently has 
harnessed magic and he's showcasing it to his followers. He's wearing a um, belly shirt when we well, when we first meet. <laughs> I mean, when I do magic, I generally right. wear a belly shirt too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so he's like worshipped by these people. I believe he he refers to himself as the pilgrim man. Puritan. Puritan. Close. Puritan. The, I was saying pilgrim man. Puritan. <laughs> it's close. He's like a Quaker uh, Oats guy. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, his his other follower, Swan, who who seems to be maybe as equal or at least respected by Nix. Benny um, from the Mummy. Benny from the Mummy. He um he doesn't quite agree with with where this cult is going and trusts Nix. Nix has kidnapped a young girl. Um. Anyways, it, it's going evil. Hijinks are ensuing. So Swan comes in and kind of ends his reign. He kills him, or what we think kills him. He seals him with this magic like. Uh, helmet thing and buries him in the desert we think he's dead and now it's 20 or 30 years later and he might be back but we are introduced to Harry Demore, who's played by Scott Bakula and he's a private eye who kind of gets swept up in this world of Swan who's now a famous magician like a uh, Siegfried and Roy type magician um, and Famke Jensen who's his wife and there's murders happening from people who were involved in this cult from so long ago. And Nix has returned. Yeah. At, yeah. Perfect. So uh, it's, it's like really it's a really complicated story, but also kind of simple. But the way it's unraveled, there's twists and turns. So it's not it's not like straightforward when you're watching it. And it's just a, the right amount of hokey, too, because, I mean, you're on surface level, you're dealing with murderous magicians right and that could get mm-hmm. really silly really fast and and it kind of, it, it's kind of self-aware um e- even when that you know at, at one point they break into like the the magic castle it's literally called like the magic castle and they have this little storeroom where all the the secrets of all the magic tricks are stored and they're even like yeah it's it's pretty hokey in here even with all these like little magic booby traps um yeah. which i i love the projector of like the <laughs> the, the brain zombie monster um, but yeah, it just has a lot of the, it, it could, it could really go one way, but I think it kind of sets the tone where it's just like in the, in the opening moments, I think is, is where it really grabs you. It's just like, there's, there's a child in the corner that's almost yeah. being fed to a baboon. It's um, just weird. Like, isn't yeah. the baboon so memorable? Like, it's so weird, but it's so memorable. It just comes off so evil. And I don't know why it never that, comes back in the story. They only had the, no. they only rented the baboon for X amount of time, but. But that, those scenes that you're talking about where, like, they're with the magicians, it, is, it feels hokey. Like, he's given those magicians shit because he knows the one's, like, just a fraud. Right. But what, when you dive into, like, the real magic of the movie with Nyx and stuff, it's, like, deeply evil uh, with his followers, how they're, like, torturing themselves and stuff. Like, that imagery sticks with me. Yeah. And, and even the good guys, like, the good... Uh, magicians like no one wants to be around them either because even like the the people at the magic castle the main guy is in uh Chevali, right mm-hmm. where he's just like what nice accent he's, he's doing this like transylvanian accent and he's like nice, yeah. nice accent is that brooklyn e- even those guys don't want anything to do with swan like because you know famke johnson's like oh he's just so talented and, and you know they're just so jealous of him that's what she tells harry but it turns out that he's just like kind of touched by the this like evil magic as well Right, right, yeah. Yeah, he, he's definitely not completely innocent, but um, he has motivations with Famke Jensen's character. Uh, he falls in love with her, and she's the young girl at the beginning of the movie who was captured by this cult. So he knows Nix is powerful, and he knows he's going to return. He's trying to protect her. So, like, I understand his motivations and stuff, but you're right. He's not, like a like, a heroic character either. Yeah, and I mean that that gets a little Harvey Weinstein for me that uh you know Swan winds up falling in love with a young child. Well, yeah, yeah, it and it's it's weirdly cuz because Famke Jensen says several times she's not in love with him. They're just kind yeah. of there together, although he certainly implies that he's in love with her. Yeah. Um much like Harvey Weinstein does to a lot of actresses. <laughs> um Right. Brian Singer all the yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I hear you. It's a weird relationship. Even some of the other characters that have, like, 
adult counterparts because like when we get butterfield in the beginning he's kind of like the the person responsible for trying to shepherd the disciples while while nix is gone and then you know is ultimately the one that, that brings him back like i didn't feel like that was a kid in the beginning he's the one with the like the david bowie eye and then they recast him later as uh um, yeah barry dell sherman who I, I, I is a super creep as far as uh i loved him goes. yeah yeah they're um there's strong sexual, like homosexual overtones in this movie. Clyde Barker's a homosexual. Right. Um, so like, I think the storyline is meant to imply there's some sort of homosexuality here with Nix and a Swan. Like he definitely wants yeah. Swan to be with him. But then you have uh, Butterfield who, you know, he dresses very uh, interesting. I, I love the way he looked and stuff. And I love the way he act. He's like very smooth. He's like a snake kind of guy. Yeah. The way he like slides into scenes and stuff, but he gets, he gets legitimately creepy at points and stuff. Yeah. I just thought he was really, really well done. Yeah. And then conversely, his underling is, I think, uh, what Loomis played by Wayne Gracie. He's this like monster with serrated teeth. It's a nice, like juxtaposition between this great i mean he butterfield straight up looks like bowie like he has yeah, like the crop yeah. top on like the gold hot pants um but yeah you're right i, I didn't even like put that together like nix is probably sexually interested in swan and he even you know towards the end of the movie where he's just like it's gonna be you and me it's so it's always been you and me and then yeah. at, after we're done i'm gonna have to kill you it's, i mean it's not overt but it, it feels it's some of that comes across especially the more you watch it like because all the characters you know with butterfield and stuff like that they 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 do feel homosexual not it's not like like i said it's not overt or anything but just because um clive barker is i i, I appreciated that aspect of the movie i thought it was an interesting take you know he's not your typical scary horror guy at least butterfield he he looked like he looks like a cool <laughs> david bowie-esque dude yeah but he can also be extremely terrifying yeah and let's talk about daniel von bergen i mean this this is this poor guy you know in real life just had a series of just tragedies like he, he attempted oh, really oh yeah he attempted suicide he like shot himself jesus in the, in the head and didn't die and then wound, wound up dying a few years later from like complications uh of diabetes like he had to have his legs removed and all this oh my god yeah and, and yeah this is the guy from like super troopers you know <laughs> he's, yeah he's the evil police pl chief which is a ramathorn um but he yeah he just uh, yeah, he was great in the faculty he always has that like he just plays the consummate dick, right? Like he is yeah. the the human embodiment of of a dick. I like how they were just he was this all powerful person. And you felt very, you felt that whenever he was on screen as yeah, Nick. he's very commanding. Yeah, but, but he, he just looks like a total schlub. He looks like a schlub, but it's again, it's like I think it's more like implying his power is not through his his like you know he's not a muscular dude or anything like that. He's not uh, visually like like strong looking or anything right. like that but like you just his his voice certainly helps uh and clive barker writes some badass lines that that come across like for me like super cool there's like he, he he's like come into the darkness demore we've been waiting for you but his delivery is like so fucking cool yeah <laughs> or he's just like i know what you're looking for while he's yeah, holding yeah. your fucking drop yeah it's That's... it's pretty like i, I feel like this film could have been edited down a little bit, even though it's only, I think, like a buck 40 or maybe like a buck 48 uh, runtime. I feel like if it was just edited a little bit more and I think I wa I think the the version that's out on it's streaming on Amazon Prime. Oh, I, it is. Really? Yeah, it is the director's cut. And the only oh, reason shit, that I know is that it really. Yeah, oh, it I is. wanted to check out the director's cut. I've oh. watched the one I have. I'll have to check that out. Like the few differences I saw was at the beginning when they're sealing Nick's when they initially kill him, they put the mask on Swan like bites his finger to where it's bleeding. They mm -hmm. made them take that out of the theatrical release. They said that was too gruesome of him oh, just okay. I have biting his thumb. It actually, I've seen this movie many times yeah. and there is that biting of the thumb always upsets me. It's the he makes sound. Like a, he makes yeah. a crunch noise and yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? How can you crunch your thumb like that? <laughs> He's like eating uh, the side of it too, so it's like, ugh. There's uh, two things. So there's a point in this movie where Harry Demore, which is Scott Abula, I'm calling him Abula because he's got <laughs> crazy abs in this movie, um, goes to this magic show where Swan's performing, right? And um, this guy gets out of this limo first, and it's this big chunky guy with this blonde woman, and he has a cigar, 
And yeah. I recognize him from this movie called Erotic Quest that I'm currently <laughs> watching for our channel, which is a softcore <laughs> pornography, uh, which he plays one of the main characters. So you got that. Uh, so his career, his career just went straight up. That's uh, literally straight up. Um, and two, have you ever been to a magic show like this? Because you worked in yeah, Las Vegas. Absolutely. Okay, so, so do people get naked at these things? <laughs> on on some of them. And do you know what the, who yeah. one of the naked dancers is? No. Carrie Ann Anaba from uh, one of the judges from Dancing with the Stars. Really? Yes. I couldn't she... believe it. Okay. Yeah. I don't watch Dancing with the Stars, but I'll have to check that out. Sometimes I do. Okay. Uh, okay. It's fine, John. <laughs> I used to work in the Miracle Mile shops, which is now inside the Planet Hollywood, used to be the Aladdin. And across from the store that I used to work at, uh, there was a, a magic ball. It was like a bar slash nightclub slash venue for this guy named Steve Wyrick who would put on magic shows. And it was just, it was just the worst. And they literally couldn't get like, they would literally be like people outside uh, giving the tickets away. Cause no one was paying for this. And I went in there and yeah, it was just basically just boobs and bad magic tricks. And I'm like, Oh boy. And I heard that's pretty much all of them in Vegas. Uh, I would be so much more into magic if it was just that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never actually been to like a magic show. If it, it it looks kind of cool, I'm not gonna lie. Like I think it'd be fun. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I heard like Depends the, the real is. upscale ones are cool, especially like the comedy ones. But the one I went to was literally like him throwing rings. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> I want like the swords falling like in this movie and stuff like that. Yeah, you want actual fatalities. Yeah, I want, I want, I want real. Yeah, I want yeah. Siegfried and Roy tigers eating them and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened. There's one character that was kind of confusing for me in this, and that's Valentin. Now, I know that the name Valentin is very important to Clive Barker, because that was when he was a child. There was, I think his name was like Maximilian Valentin or something, who in Europe, he was doing a skydiving show or something, and he is shoot didn't go off and he literally watched this man fall to his death. So he's always used the name Valentin in most of his his works. But just as far as this movie goes, I, I don't remember him in the beginning when they're all, you know, go, going to save. No, the young he's Dorothea. not in the beginning. Yeah. Who is this guy? He's just like he, the hired butler. He's like, yeah, he's like a uh, swan. He, when Swan becomes famous, it seems like he's like his handler or like his personal assistant. But he's certainly aware of the real realism of magic. Um, and right. he knows you know what what has been done and what where what swan is and everything like that because he he just becomes kind of important to the plot i think he's more like a plot device than anything else it's like dorothea was there when well she's the in, initially the one that shoots nicks and you know she doesn't even know where he's buried but this mm -hmm. guy does Th that was just kind of a weird you're right that's kind of a weird yeah i never even thought about that if he was one of the main guys at the beginning, that would have made more sense. And he should have been. He was, like, the right age for it. Right, yeah. Like, practical effects in this, though, were just so good. Like, they were used more sparingly than... Like, a, like a Hellraiser is a special effect, like a practical yeah. effects highlight reel, right? Yes. It's just, like, hit after hit. Every scene, it's, like, pushing the envelope. This is used more sparingly because I think he used more time for character development. Certainly. I think that worked really well it, though. It's the, uh, it's the, like the noir aspect of this movie, yeah. which is really interesting too. Cause it's like a horror noir, which is not something I've ever seen done before. Yeah. Cause it does play out like a forties, like Scott Bakula plays the, that private eye kind of guy with a white, you know, arm, uh, muscle shirt on and a, <laughs> a hat. And he's he's de definitely like solving this mystery. You see him uncovering clues and stuff like that. So it plays out a little bit different than your standard horror movie. So it's not like a because Hellraiser kind of devolves into just you know running around a haunted house by the end. Yeah. Um, and this movie certainly kicks up by the end as well. But be I think because the story is a bit more ambitious and where it weaves all around to all these different locations and stuff like that, I think it might be a little harder as well to just turn it into some. You know what I mean? Simple jump scare kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I mean, th there are definitely jump scares. Really cool jump scares, though. Like Scott Bakula is talking to his partner. Or, I mean, he's a PI, so I guess he doesn't have a partner, but some, mm. a friend or whatever in the apartment. And they're just literally talking. He's like, hey, you, you know, you should go take this job. You need a vacation. And then just like out of nowhere, it shows this <gasps> Dude, crazy demon that kid. That flashback and... is so awesome. <sighs> it is like three seconds long, and it is so disturbing. Because it's that's what I that's what I like. Like 
when you have something, especially Clyde Barker with his visuals, if you show them so quickly, it's it's so much more memorable because yes. you're like, wait, what did I see? Yep. Is that? Oh my god! But when you show something for so long, you know, like Hellraiser, which I love, but like you get numb by the it. end. By the end, you get the Slimer creature. You know <laughs> what I mean? At the end, you're like, okay, that's where you kind of jump the shark in Hellraiser. Right. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't it, in your mind it starts you start to lose the wonder, and I think that's what a really good horror movie is when it just it, it's the the image in your mind is working more than the movie is. A- absolutely, I mean it's just I think that's what he does so well across the board. Where, like you said, he uses it more sparingly because I mean even in like it, where Hellraiser it, again very disturbing images, and they sure. just put so much work into all the costumes, all that, it, it almost like warrants. It's just like, hey, you know, even though, even if you're kind of numb to it towards the end of it, it's just such a cool experience to be oh, gross in so that unique world. Oh, it's yeah, so unique. Yeah. yeah. But like, this was just so good because like you said, it was, it was like a, a crime noir horror, which I can't really think of a, a, something to compare that to. And when, when they do do the horror, even like something like him punching the guy out the window and just him like smacking on the it, pavement. It's explicit. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's so yeah. much more effective too. Yeah. Uh, the first act of the movie is really strong. The third act is extremely strong. And the second act is a bit slow and gets a little cheesy. Yeah. That's kind of like my overall <laughs> thoughts of the movie. But yeah. like the very end of the movie, there's some really strong visuals with people being sucked into like the sand and drying up. And it's just extremely disturbing. And I love it. Yeah. The way that cult just worships him and begins cutting themselves and their hair. And it's just they're like, look, they look like normal people. You know right. what I mean? They're like dressed like nerds. Some of them like they just look like normal people came over and just started going crazy. And, it, and that's what like it makes it seem so so much more darker than it is because he's just like this, like we said, like some schlubby guy walking around. He, he doesn't even have all his hair or anything. Because I mean, it, it kind of te- it, it does a lot of show don't tell in the opening credits where it shows his effects or at least mm-hmm. this this entity that is next. Maybe this guy was a normal guy, right? But I just think this like force kind of took over this person in, in this town. I mean, maybe he was delving deep because maybe he was an illusionist to start with. It doesn't really get into it all that much, but, you know, it, it, this force, this entity has kind of wiped out this whole town. Like, it just op- the opening credits are just, like, chickens and cows eviscerated, and then you get to go to this, you know, this little house where everyone in the town that's left that probably hasn't died or moved away uh, is left. And, and, and like you said, they all just look like teachers and, and grocery store workers and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they just, yeah, he just, like, walks out after being resurrected. He's just, like, suffer for me. And they just, like, put their knees down on, like, broken on glass. glass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, will you suffer. Yeah. Did you think, because because they don't, like, hide it at all, like, the very beginning of the movie, you show that Nyx is some like demonic kind of thing with magic powers. Like they straight up show you that at the beginning. They show you everything that happens to him. But then when we cut back, we're with Scott Bakula, who knows nothing. And we kind of follow his journey of him piecing it together, even though we already know right. about a lot of this. I, it's an interesting way of telling the story. And I was still really compelled throughout. But it's to me, it's just kind of weird because a lot of it we already know as a viewer. Right. So I don't know. I just I just thought that was interesting. I th- I thought it was I thought it was effective. Like I said, it, it showed enough. It it cut out the fat story wise, of uh you know it didn't need to have a ton of exposition. We were kind of just thrown right into it, and it for some reason it worked because you know you have your big your your big bad at the beginning and then he gets wiped out pretty quickly, and then you don't see him again until you know there's only like thirty minutes left of the runtime. Mm-hmm. That's that's a ballsy move for a horror movie. Yeah, I think I think because this movie spends a lot of time developing the characters or the relationships there with Swan and Damore and um, Famke Jensen's character, uh, whatever the hell her name is. Uh, Dorothea. D- Dorothea. How could I forget Dorothea? <laughs> such such not a Famke Jen- Like, you look at <laughs> Famke Jensen, you don't think of the name Dorothea? No. <laughs> it's like calling her Ruthie or something? Yeah. I- <laughs> At first, like with Scott Bakula, I was like, right. I mean, I don't have anything against Scott Bakula, <laughs> but it's like, really? It's like putting Henry Winkler in there. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. And but by the end, I was like on board. I don't know. He he's he's not bad. It's just he's weird. <laughs> he's just he's Scott Bakula. Yeah, he's, he's, he's your dad's PI. Does he's, he swear? 
Or is he no, like not, swears gosh, a lot? Gosh darn it there, Nix. You better you better stop doing all them blood sacrifices there, Nix. <laughs> gosh darn it. Right. No, the the swearing is uh rampant okay. in this, which is yeah. which was very jarring, like hearing Scott back, you know, because he's he's like my uncle or something, just hearing him yeah. like cuss out people. I'm like, like oh, Scott. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't you know mom's around? The the end for me also uh really cool. A little bit over the top, the very last sequence, but um I really like his return, his resurrection. Sure. And the way Nick's just kinda like uh Butterfield is his like main henchman who's been driving his return this entire time. And like when he's finally back, he just casts him aside and like slaps him because he never really cared about anyone but Swan. Right. Which is to me like so cool that you have this super evil guy and in any other movie he just like I want to kill everything and everybody's got to die which he right. does say he wants to murder the world but yeah. he has like this also very deeply personal like association with this guy and you're never really quite sure why but you just know he has one and he's right. like willing to like forgive all this stuff just because he wants him and that's where I was like maybe there's just some homosexual overtones with this sure. uh, or just you know sexual overtones in general like it doesn't matter, but like there seems some sort of desire there. I think it's something on the lines of, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but maybe like as far as power level goes, because Swan also can do sure, all these powerful. things. Yeah, where he thinks of him maybe not as an equal, but close to it. So you know, because he obviously he still thinks he's better than him because he's yeah trying to uh, you know like a succubus almost or a male male version of a succubus. No male, male not a maleubus. No, it's a oh my god. Snork, snorkubus, succubus, incubus, oh, incubus, incubus. I'm like, what, what, what? 1990s band did band. I see open yeah. for corn? Yeah, uh, incubus. Either it's either Limp Biscuit or Incubus. <laughs> Rammstein. It's Rammstein. <laughs> it's Rammstein. This is the Rammstein of Clyde Barker films. I yeah. like um, the music. Yes. The first track that opens with the opening of the movie, you have like these cool dusty visuals and you like all these dead animals and stuff. Um, but it sounds to me like a song from the Hellraiser soundtrack. Mm -hmm. The rest of the movie, not so much. But it is it is done by this guy, Simon... What the hell is his name? It is Simon Boswell. Yeah, and he did... Uh, what the hell did he do? He did some other stuff that I... I th oh, that's going to drive me nuts. Hardware. He did uh, Richard Stanley movies. He did Dust Devil and Hardware. Oh, which, okay. Which also have really cool soundtracks. That's why I was... I, I remember that name. Um, but yeah, I thought that the music was pretty cool in this movie. I don't know. This is to me a movie I watch every every year or two. Um, much like most of Clive Barker's movies, I I constantly, not constantly. I'm not sitting here every day, but I I do often look him up on the internet. I'm like, is, is Clive Barker making a new movie? Because I would love to see something else by him. Well, I mean, he's writing he, the new Hellraiser, right? Uh, I saw that, but who knows? I have no idea if that's ever going to come to be. And I don't know. I don't even know if I need to see that. Right. Uh, I don't but, know, man. I, I feel like there's so many good new, uh, like, horror movie filmmakers, like the guy that just did, like, Midsommar and um, mm -hmm. Hereditary. I, I, his, Ari, Ari Aster. Yeah, Ari Aster. Ari Aster, yeah. So, I mean, it, there's there's some good, like, the guy that did Mandy um, would be an interesting choice. There yeah. Are, there's a resurgence and, and written by Clive Barker because I think that's what you kind of need. His... He's a great writer, but great writer. but then he he likes to smell his own farts a little bit. Like that's why we got so much of the origami man. Like the the bad the bad scene where he was just like, oh, I'm gonna push the envelope with, with CGI. It's 1995. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. That didn't work. It wasn't even clear why that was in the movie. Oh, uh, man. The he is definitely more pretentious like hellraiser to me is definitely more of a pretentious horror movie yes it, it dives into cheesy levels but it's nothing like a friday the 13th or nightmare on m street like it, it definitely rises above that for me yeah but like in its storytelling like the story is way more interesting to me again just because it's it feels to me inspired by lovecraft that kind of thing where the you have the abyss you have the unknown it's doomsday uh, type yeah yeah um, but yeah, I, I just really like Clyde Barker's writing. Mm -hmm. His his horror always comes off as just a bit darker than most things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, who, who would you recommend this film to as far, you know, a lot of horror fans, of course, but for someone that hasn't seen this, like, if you're a fan of, you know, who would you recommend it to? 
I mean, I think if you like Hellraiser, you'd probably like this. It shares a lot of similarities to it, to me. It does, but it doesn't. I, I feel like it tonally... Um, tonally is different, And yeah. pacing-wise, it's completely different, where this is sure. so much more restrained than Hellraiser's. That's all yeah. excess and just them True. throwing pig's blood in your face for you know 90 minutes where this is like yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a thinker it does bog down in the middle to a screeching halt but yeah i don't know i i, I honestly don't I, I guess it takes somebody who can who can deal with a bit of a slower yeah paced horror movie um and and be willing to let some of those 90s cheap effects go yeah yeah, ah, man, if you just I want the I, I want to make a director's cut and just take out the origami man, um, dude. But, if they could have just cut the scene and like had a sound and like him, cut, yeah, find the body or something instead of that origami thing. I, at the time, maybe that was cool. I don't know. I don't even understand who it was. Was that I didn't Swan it. doing it? I have no it? idea. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't even think Scott Bakula knew. I like, don't. <laughs> Scott Bakula was so like you could see him even walk through the that doorway and you see ob the obvious shift to green screen like th a good fifteen seconds before yeah. the explosion goes. <laughs> so yeah. bizarre. Yeah. So bizarre. It was just so much better than that scene. <laughs> what was the guy's name in Quantum Leap? It was oh what Scott Bakula's Iggy? character. Iggy? Who did he call in his little recorder thing? Iggy? No, I have no idea. It's Shit. been so long since so I've seen Squan Quantum Leap. Squantum Quantum Leap. Leap. Squantum Leap. That's a reboot we need. <laughs> Bring it back. Squandered Leap with uh, Squandered Leap with Dad Bakula. Such a weird movie for him. What the fuck were they thinking? <laughs> Scott Bakula. <laughs> if Amka Jansen's another one of those like William Defoe characters where she was, you know, they're never old and they're never young. They're just always yeah, kind of middle aged. Yeah, she looks the same. Yeah. Yeah. She she was in like a B movie era though. Or, well, not technically B movie, but she went on to do Deep Rising and stuff after this. So, Oof. which is hey, I'm not saying it's a bad movie. No, I'm just saying yeah. it's a it's a movie. It's it's a movie. You know, <laughs> it is a movie. Look it up oh, or did, don't. Yeah. So when Scott Bakula, sorry to cut back, but when Scott Bakula gets his job of uh, photographing, uh, not photographing taking photos sure. of some dude he's hired as a pi was was that andrew dice clay with a bunch of hookers or not because <laughs> it looked like andrew dice clay to me it really did i'm gonna i'm gonna say no been a little bit past the dice man's time yeah yeah he was already in jail at that point okay that's fair that's fair <laughs> I, so were you happy with it did I, I i was you uh, enjoyed it i liked the difference it, or i, I I like the new direction that it took horror and especially like I transported my brain back into 1995 or at least tried to. And I'm just like, wow, this really was, uh, it, it really put the genre on, on its own head, which was pretty cool. Um, that's, that's ex so like Hellraiser is just kind of straight up like a Gothic horror movie. Yeah. Uh, but then you have Nightbreed, which is again, like this whole new animal. It's like a fantasy horror, right. weird horror thing and they don't make those kind of things very often and then for this to go into this weird noir thing that's what i'm saying like i wish clive barker was still making movies yeah i don't know I it's just they're always interesting they're not they're not they're not generic in any way you definitely could see his his influences like he was really influenced by like fellini and argento films he was inspired by kind of taking the genre but but just going that extra leap more like every every interview you see starts with uh you know a black screen and then it flashes on the screen the, the next level or, or the the new voice of horror is clive barker said by stephen king like he's super proud of that which i would be too i mean shit. yeah that's probably more like we can sell more movies if we put that on there <laughs> stephen king who, who knows yeah yeah, I mean, if Stephen King said literally said anything about me, I would put it on everything. Even yeah. if he's like, "You're an asshole," I'd be, I'd be on my poster. Stephen <laughs> King, you're an asshole. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like this movie quite a bit, and I, I thank you for for coming on and and suggesting it. And this was fun, not just talking about this film with you, but talking about a film that I haven't seen. That I'm like, you know, I, you can't see them all. I, I watch a lot of film, but some of them just kind of fall through the cracks and. In 1995, I was probably, I think I was like 11 years old and it was, I was still kind of in that phase. Like I wouldn't even watch The Walking Dead until like season six because I was afraid of zombies. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah. So I'm like kind of a new horror fan, but I'm like such a horror fan now. Like it, it's all 
gets to flush in now, which is cool because I get to watch it with like adults, jaded eyes, and and it's it's yeah. a lot of fun. When I originally said I was going to come on the show, I said I'd watch. We could talk about Dark Man. Right. Have you seen Dark Man? No, that was another one. Oh, God, I got to come back on. <laughs> All right, next week on the Sam ne- Raimi movie. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll keep this <laughs> bad movie night takeover going. Yeah, this is as you saw last week. Uh, we had Ian on talking Death to Smoochie, and then this week uh, Chris. So yeah, anytime that you guys want to grace your presence on the Cult of Films, you're always welcome. But yeah, tell everyone what you're up to, what you do, and thanks again for coming on, man. Uh, Bad Movie Night. We have a YouTube channel and podcast. Just search for Bad Movie Night. We have around 300 videos. We do uh, video reviews of low budget VOD movies generally. Some some occasional theatrical releases and then we have our podcast which john has been on several times he's our number one guest uh where we just talk about obscure 70s 80s 90s horror sci-fi action movies take a deep dive into them and things get weird and goofy (laughs) so perfect socials where can where can people contact you all all of them we're looking uh instagram twitter facebook linkedin for if you got a job resume (laughs) nice um no just search for Bad Movie Night, come up on everything. Perfect. I, yeah. I'm, I'm still, like, not Instagram savvy. Like, that's the final frontier for me, I think. Yeah, it's it's definitely harder because I people generally just use it completely on their phones, and I don't. I'm, like, using it on the computer. Apparently, I'm a weirdo because I do that. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's just all images, and I never know what to put up there. Yeah. All right. Well, you could find me right here on this very <laughs> channel. Uh, what is this called? Segue. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, you can't find me on Instagram, but you can find me on Twitter at Orzov Done. You can find me uh, doing movie and Magic the Gathering videos every week right here on They Said We Said. So uh, if you like to hear this in podcast form only, you can do so by going to Spotify, uh, iTunes, all that. Leave me five fucking apples or however people rate stuff on those. Uh, platforms, but until next time, I don't know. I don't have anything for this. Do you got? Give me a Lord of Illusions out. Uh, uh, uh yeah. Um, perfect. Scott, Scott, Scott Bakula. <laughs> Scott Dabula. Wait, what'd you call him? Scott, Scott what? Abula? I, I called him Scott Abula. Perfect. I was impressed. Uh, I don't uh, know about you. This is literally now just an ima- a zoomed in image of Scott Bakula's abs. Perfect. In the film, there's quite a lot. I mean, it's quite gory. Yeah. That's quite explicit. Do you yeah. think it might be uh, sometimes better to leave it to the imagination? That might be scary. No, no. I, I, uh, I like to, I like to show everything. I mean, in the books, in the in the film, I want to be able to detail everything. If there's a monster comes on, I want to know how many heads it's got. Yeah, and the audience yeah. needs to know too. <laughs>